All right, shall we begin? I think we should begin. Um, so a very warm welcome to our uh, OEZ and University of Toronto community joining us today. Thank you. Uh, we're very proud of our Writer's Roof series. This is actually the last session, uh, season finale of season one. Uh, and we hope to bring you more um, uh, sessions in the new year. Uh, and uh, a very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Uh, I, I see the numbers are trickling in, so welcome. Uh, before I begin, I wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates for thousands of years. This has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And now I would like to uh, pass on uh, uh, the virtual floor to Perry King, who will uh, introduce our distinguished guests today, but also a quick shout out to Chandra and Courtney, who are working the, their magic behind the scenes to make today's event possible. Thank you to both of you. Over to you, Perry. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sim. So, as Sim said, I am, uh, I'm Perry. I am the communications officer here at OISE, and I am so thrilled to, to be introducing both of these men uh, for what's gonna be a really nice conversation. You know, today marked fall convocation for our community, uh, for hundreds of our now graduated students. We hope uh, that some of you have found your way to events like these. Uh, OISE holds much of uh, uh, events like these all year round. Okay, um, as you may know, Jeff Myers, uh, he's a proud uh, OISE graduate and uh, former president of the OISE Graduate Students Association and the uh, OISE Alumni Association. Uh, today, Jeff serves as the Director of Enrollment and Academic Strategy with a world-renowned international education organization. Uh, his graduate research at OISE focused on second language education and citizenship learning. Driven by the ideals and challenges of international education, Jeff has written and spoken about this topic in various publications and conferences worldwide. He's our uh, Writer's Roost host, and he's being joined by Dr. John P. Portelli. Uh, Dr. Portelli is an award-winning Maltese Canadian author and educator. Uh, a professor emeritus in OIC's Department of Social Justice Education, he has published 23 books, including seven collections of poetry, two collections of short stories, and over 100 articles and chapters in books. Amazing. Uh, two of his books have won the American Educational Studies Association Critic Award, and another of his books won the Canadian Association for the Foundations of Education Book Award. He is frequently invited to give keynote addresses and workshops and things like Writer's Roost uh, in areas of research and teaching, which include narratives of migration and exile, continuous professional development and quality assurance, student engagement and students at risk, uh, teaching controversial issues, uh, intercultural education and dialogue, equity and ethical issues in policy and leadership and social justice education. And we're so thrilled to have Dr. Portelli here with us tonight. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Perry. I'll just slightly update my profile, which is that I very recently began a position here at Dalhousie University in Halifax as the Director of Community Partnerships and Projects. So I would just like to slightly add to Sim's land, uh, land acknowledgement to say that I'm coming to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people here in Nova Scotia. And I'm so excited that John is here, but just before we jump into the interview, I would also like to plug our very own Perry's book, uh, which just came out and uh, I'm very excited to read it. It just came in the mail two days ago. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to put that up there as well. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> And maybe I'll report more on that once I've read the book. <laughs> but here we're we're here tonight to talk about uh, John P. Portelli's book, Everyone But Baja. And before I get started, I, as I mentioned, I'm, I've recently taken a position at Dalhousie. And John, you had a position here at Dalhousie. I learned that from reading your profile. Tell me about that. I I was a postdoc, uh, a Killian postdoc at Dalhousie in uh, 1986. No, 1985, 86. And it was renewed for 86, 87, but then I got a teaching uh, tenure track position at Mount St. Vincent University, where I taught for 13 years. Oh, wow. Before moving to Toronto in 1999. So you know the city pretty well? Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. We're and, tonight um, 
Go ahead, sorry. The, the building at Dalhousie was the so-called education building, uh, which was an old barracks building and then renovated. But um, the building has been pulled down and a new building apparently there. It's just across from the uh, soccer field. That's been my experience because I, I came to Dal for my undergrad and coming back to Halifax and coming back onto campus, say, well, more than 20 years later, I, I mean, half the buildings I used to know are no longer here. It the building the I'm coming to today. Side, it was on the left-hand side of the administration building. Oh, right. Okay. I know which building you mean. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we're here tonight to talk about everyone but Faja. Uh, I have a lot of questions. Uh, we usually go for about 30 to 40 minutes and I'll jump right into it. The first thing I'd like to say is that I, and it's a beautiful cover design, by the way, who did your cover? The cover design was done by a Maltese um, designer. His name is Mario, um, Mario Car Cardona. Um, he is a designer who works with a major Maltese publisher and the name of the publisher is Horizons. Most of my literary work has been originally written in Maltese and most of it has been published by, by Horizons. Um, Horizons together with Word and Deed, which is a Canadian publisher in Burlington, they conjointly published the English translation of the novel. One of the things I always do before these Writer Roost episodes is try to under, like uh, look online and make sure I have the pronunciation correct. And I have to tell you, I was stymied by this name because I Googled it and Google failed me. Is it an invented name or is there no, no, significance no, is around not. the name for you? No, it, is, it is a very common Arabic name used a lot for females in, in the Arab speaking world. And the meaning of the word Faiza means the courageous person. And that was a good trick for me to get you to say the name so I know how to pronounce it. So we're here actually to talk about everyone but Faiza. Thank you for that. Faiza. <laughs> so tell me about the book, John. What's it about? What are the main themes? What do you want to what do you want the audience to know about the it? The book, the book is is very much like a thriller. I mean, it starts with um with uh, a, a incident, a nasty incident um, uh, that happened to Faiza. And this incident is reported by the major media in Toronto, radio stations, TV, and newspapers. That is the initial chapter. Um, they all give the various interpretations as newspapers usually do, um, all claiming to be factual. And then of course, it's up to the reader to decide what is factual or not, unfortunately. And um, the only common thing about the reports is that something quite tragic happened to Faiza and Faiza is now unconscious in a hospital in Toronto. Um, that is the setting of the scene. Um, the rest of the novel is eight major characters who had a relationship uh, with Faiza, um, either families or ex-boyfriends, husband, and so on. And um, each chapter starts with each of these major characters um, seeing Faiza unconscious in a coma in hospital. And then they start talking to us, the, the readers, um, about their relationship with Faiza. And they all give their own story. And uh, they all, independent of each other, conclude uh, that um, whatever happened to Faiza was their own fault. Um, and of course, as they narrate their own story in relation to Faiza, a general story develops until we reach to the concluding chapter. And I won't reveal what happens in the concluding chapter. So those who haven't read the novel, um, I won't ruin it um, for them. Um, in terms of themes, the major theme is, I mean, um, Faiza is the daughter of um, um, immigrants in Toronto, the father happens to be Maltese and the mother uh, Turkish of Kurdistani origin. 
um, and and um, she's married to an Italian fellow, and her ex-boyfriend was also of Maltese origin. His girlfriend is of Spanish Moroccan. So I mean, it is it is really a novel about the existential lived experiences of immigrants in this case in 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 Canada and and um, and it involves a lot of the tensions uh, and also some positive experiences of course that immigrants encounter in Canada so that is that is the that is the major theme there is of course the whole theme of guilt and shame, which reflects itself in a variety of ways in, 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 in the novel. You talked about the way the book opens, and I, it was such a it was such an engaging opening, actually. And just to repeat what you said, there's Thank multiple you. news stories that you kind of cobble together an idea of what happened, although they each have a different perspective or uh, slant on it, let's say. And, and that is unfortunate in some ways, but then the same thing happens with the characters. As they each tell their version of the story, the same thing happens. You're getting a little version of the truth and all of them sort of add up to, I guess, the assembly of the truth. That's a really interesting literary device. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like why you chose that as the, as the device? Yes, I mean, um, I do not believe that literature ought to have a moral let me let me say it up front. Um, of course, this does not mean that literature should not be used for educational purposes or as an impetus for critical and engaging discussions. Okay, but I did not write the novel to to get across a certain moral or none at all. Okay. Absolutely none at all. My major thing was to write something, which in my view is what good literature is all about, that engages the reader, captures the reader, and is enjoyable for the reader and connects with the life of the reader. That is what I tried to do. Having said that, I purposely chose this style of writing which is um, um, critical realist and minimalist. I mean, the novel could have been much longer, but I, I very much believe in, in, um, in critical realist, minimalist writing, which gives a lot of space for the reader to imagine things that might have happened between the scenes and between, you know, behind scenes, so, so, so to speak. I give enough details to give, of course, the atmosphere and so on, and, and there is crisp engaging dialogue also, uh, which is another strategy. Uh, but then the rest is up to the mind and heart and spirit of the reader. Um, that is one point. Another part of the style, um, almost like a scaffolding, so to speak, building on each other, um, repeating some things, and yet we are not always sure whether they are truly repeating or giving us a completely new perspective, okay? And this, to me, is a reflection of a critical realist dialogic, if you may, um, epistemology. Um, this is how I look at life in the world. Um, I, I very much believe, well, things happen, there are facts, uh, but then of course the interpretation of facts and what we make out of facts is continuously, continuously being worked out, constructed, reconstructed, even if we do not speak with someone else, we are as human beings, constantly engaged in this exciting venture of human beings to reconstruct and reconstruct um, um, what, what we think is happening, okay? 
it's a uh, version of what history is, right? Like that's what well, hi- well, history in some ways, is. And, well, it depends. It depends on what philosophy of history you 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 hold. Fair enough. Right? I mean, there are some historians who believe in 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 fixed, yeah. rigid historiographies where things happen and happened and then this and this way, and this is the definitive interpretation of what happened. That is not the way how I look at the world. So the novel, um, right from the very beginning with the different interpretations and snapshots from the media continues in this style as the characters have, have evolve. And, and each character, if you analyze, has an internal tension with herself or himself vis-a-vis what they think might be happening, both to Faiza and to themselves, which is, of course, in my view, a very realistic existential predicament that we as human beings encounter. But, but unfortunately, even in education, it is an important human aspect that is either denied or not given the proper importance in education itself. This is also my view of the world, which is why I think I love the book so much, but it's also a little bit, and I think you said it, it's it's almost disorienting because you you read one one person's version and then you sort of have to skip back and go, but, but that's a completely opposite view of what somebody else said, or 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 did I know that already? And so it's quite an interesting which, which is back in and forth what, journey. Which is in fact what we encounter in life. I yes. mean, we yes. wish it. We wish it to be otherwise, yeah. including myself. But, <laughs> but this is what we are as human beings. We are completely unfinished. We are completely creative and imaginative, and messy and contradictory, and yeah, all of those yeah. things. Yeah. You mentioned the style of writing, and I. It's it's very concise, even parsimonious. Uh, writing and it's actually that's the style I, I like the most. I mean, you're a very accomplished writer in, in in numerous formats. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that style of writing and if there was a sure. an objective or a message in that style of writing, or is that how you prefer to write? Well, my writing is always to the point and concise, even even in the academic writing. Um, my articles are usually not longer than fifteen pages. I believe always, and those, maybe there are some people in the audience who have taken classes with me, I believe that a decent paper should not be more longer than 12 pages. If we have something to say, 12 pages is sufficient. Of course, to really decide what to put in 12 pages is not easy, okay? (laughs) But then writing is not easy, even even for someone like myself who has written quite a bit. I mean, I enjoy it. But, but it is also a struggle. I mean, and, and I say this in a positive way. So if there are, you know, people who write and prospective students and current students, please do not be discouraged. This is normal. The articles you read, the books you read, whether it is poetry and novels or even academic articles, they are never written, you know, at first blush in the manner in which they are published. I mean, lots and lots of revisions, okay? So please don't give up on that. Uh, but my writing, even the academic writing, Jeff, is 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 always very concise and to the point. Um, if I can say it in one sentence, I will not say it in two or three sentences. Okay. Um, um, I call it uh, even in teaching. I call it a pedagogy of economics, if you will. <laughs> uh, like and <laughs> and um, and um, if 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 we have something to say, as I said. I think it, 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 is, it is better to say it in a concise, clear, direct way. Even in my academic writing, some people enjoy it because it is like this. Others may critique it, uh, and that is okay. I always write as if I am talking with someone because I believe that the aim of writing is finally to communicate and converse with other people. And and even academic writing should be accessible to a wider audience. And this is why towards the end of my career, namely in the last 10 years, my writing, besides the academic one, has focused quite a bit on the literary, poetry, short stories, and novels, because I have come to the conclusion 
that as an intellectual, I am better off writing literary work rather than narrow, rigid, cold academic work that has very little access in terms of the, to the general public. I think literature has more possibility of communicating, conversing with people. This is not a question on my list, but you just triggered a memory for me. I was listening to a podcast recently where the author of a book called Nudge, he was, he's an academic, but he's like, he's a character. He's got a lot of humor in his, in his non-academic writing. And he said he left academia because they took all the joy out of writing. Is there no hope for academic writing or can you, yes. can you yes. inject that literary style into academic writing? I, I, I think so. I think, well, first of all, for example, there are many intellectuals who left the academia exactly for these reasons. Perhaps one of the most famous um, of, of such authors is the African-American Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks was a professor in very renowned universities in the US, but it's exactly for this reason. In other words, the narrowness, the rigidness, the coldness, if you will, the colonial style of North American universities that urged her to leave and to start writing in a different way. And of course, those who have read Bell Hooks know she's an extremely engaging author. I mean, I'm not comparing myself to Bell Hooks. I'm, I'm simply saying, giving a classic example of someone who left the academia exactly for these reasons. Unfortunately, for, you know, personal practical reasons, I couldn't leave the academy and live as, as, as a literary author. I mean, it's very difficult to live as a literary author. You hardly make any, any, any money. So yeah. I had to do something, something else. Um, but yes, I think the literary component of, of, of writing needs to be emphasized more in, in education in general, whether it is in elementary schools and high schools, um, colleges, universities, and so on. And, and um, I want to give credit to OISI. I mean, I do criticize some things at OISI. I mean, sure. people know this, uh, uh, but, but I have to give credit where it is due. And that is that I was allowed with lots of freedom to develop a new course eight years ago, after I spent three, five years reading um, a course entitled Narratives of Migration and Exile Implications for Education. Oh, and the only course. thing that is required reading in this course is our literary works, poetry, short stories, and novels that deal with um, issues of uh, migration and exile. Okay. Now, if people want to read other formal academic things. I give people a long um, list of readings, but the required readings are all literary. And the results have been so much engaging and, and, and powerful. Um, students, instead of writing the usual formal paper, they, can, they have the option to do that as well. And if someone wants to write a formal paper, that is fine. I'm not saying it is not worthwhile. But most students are, um, write short stories. And what has emerged through the short stories writing is incredible. I mean, students saying, I have been wanting to write like this almost throughout all my life. And I was never given the opportunity to express myself in this creative way. And this, of course, after 15, 17 years of education. I mean, it doesn't ogre well for education, does it? I, first, I want to get that reading list from you after this episode, so I'll be ready well, to you. Send about. me an email, I will send it to you. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. To anyone, that is. You, you wrote, the, you wrote uh, everyone but Faiza. Oh my God, I've already forgotten the pronunciation. Faiza. Faiza, thank you. Uh, in Maltese originally, as you mentioned. Yes. And I, I, I believe you used the same translator multiple times, and I trust she did an excellent job, but of course, every translation is ultimately a facsimile of the original. So I'm wondering, is there anything we might miss somehow in the English translation? Um, honestly, I don't think so. Um, Irene Manjon, who is a professional translator, Maltese professional translator, who studied in the UK and Germany and Italy, um, um, has an exquisite literary English. I mean, I, I can write in English, literary stuff in English, but 
but um, I don't think I have um, the literary richness that someone like Irena Manjong has. I mean, and this is because all my life, since I was 18, all I did was write, um, write, um, write essays and academic, academic books and nothing else, you know. Um, and, and, and I believe my writing is good English, but it's a very different kind of English from writing a novel. So I have always chosen consciously to write um, any literary format, whether it is poetry, of which, as you have mentioned, I have seven collections, four of which, by the way, are of a bilingual nature. Three are Maltese with English translation. One is English and French. Um, and at the moment, there is someone who is writing a master's thesis in translation in Malta, and she's translating my latest uh, collection called This Malicious Wind into, into English from Maltese. Okay, This was a book uh, launched last August in Malta. And, um, um, yes, I consciously write in Maltese to make a political statement. Um, Malta is a very small country. It is the smallest EU country, one of the smallest countries in the British Commonwealth, a uh, population of only half a million with a very, very long history, eight, 9,000 years. Um, and we have always been colonized. I mean, part of me wants to say we are still colonized today. Mm as full members of the EU, but let me not go there for a while. Um, and, and, uh, uh, and I'm not saying it is bad to be in the EU. I mean, you know, there are pros and cons. But, but, but the fact of the matter is that we have always been colonized. And in the last 30, 40 years, there has been a lot of negative impact towards the Maltese language, unfortunately by Maltese themselves. And therefore the political decision to write all my literary work in Maltese to make a political statement. And I have had colleagues both in Malta and here who say, you know, you, you write very nicely in English. Why don't you write in English? I say, no, I want to write in Maltese because I don't want Maltese to, to end as a language, you know? So, and then of course, given the smallness of Malta, uh, unless we translate, we are going to remain in, in a small bubble without sharing our ideas and our feelings with, with, um, with other people in the world. And I was lucky to encounter someone like Irena Manjon, who of course gets paid for her translations and, and she has done marvelous, marvelous work. She has it's translated nice. poetry, she has translated the short stories and she has translated Faiza. At the moment, Faiza is being translated into Arabic and into Romanian and into Chinese as well. So I think the role of translators is often underappreciated. I, I sometimes think their name should be on the front cover because it's 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 an artistic version of, of your original. Yes, I, that, I love that, the idea. With any translator I have worked with, I give them the full freedom to interpret because I truly believe that translation is an act of creation itself. Absolutely. Of course, you know, one has to test and they give me samples and I check. I mean, if the translation is completely far away from the original, then of course I have to raise some, some questions. But as I said, I was lucky. All my translators have really gotten to the spirit of my writing. And if they are in doubt, they communicate with me and we always talk and decide on certain terms. I mean, there are, I mean, the story is very, very completely faithful to the original. There may be some descriptions like certain expressions that we have in Maltese, which are almost impossible to translate into English. And this happens with any language, by the way. And therefore, of course, I, Irene, Manjon, and I, but mostly Irene, had to select what kind of expression. And of course, the kind of expression may give a slight different characteristic to a character, for example. But the major, the, the core of the characters and definitely the core of the story has not been changed. The readers will notice we're not actually talking that much about the core of the story, but in, because in, in part, because in preparing for tonight, 
it's difficult to talk about it without giving away some of the, yes, you know, yes. the mystery. I, I, right? I understand that. I understand. But I, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was of the, the story, world. Jeff. A story always has both the content and the format. And sure. of course, both of them have to go hand in hand. So, you know. yes. One of the themes I wanted to pick up on, then, John, was the, the role of the expat or immigrant neighborhood. I mean, you talk yes, a lot about yes, the yes. Maltese neighborhood in Toronto and the historically Maltese neighborhood in the Junction, which yes. is home to a number of different European, Eastern European communities as well. Yes. I, yes. I'm so fascinated by those neighborhoods because they're simultaneously like clearly identifiable, but also indistinguishable from the kind of cultural and geographic fabric that's around that it's, you know, in, that's right. in, and, in it, right? and this is one of the, for me, one of the very positive things about Toronto that we still have these enclaves um, you know, I don't believe in multiculturalism that should be completely isolated in enclaves because then there are other other problems. But but in terms of issues, the politics of identities, I think these these neighborhoods I think help. Okay. Um, now I have only lived in Toronto for twenty three years, but I have only. Been, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, there are there are people maybe in the audience who have lived their entire life in, in Toronto, right? I'm 67, so 23 is only one third, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, um, uh, but I have been in Canada for 44 plus years. And I will never forget the first time, and, and my first home was Montreal, the first eight years, of course, I studied at McGill. And, um, but in January, 1978, I visited Toronto for the first time. And I will never forget this encounter with the Maltese uh, area, the Maltese village uh, between Ranemede and uh, Kiel on Dundas Street West. And I walked with um, a couple of good friends of mine and we walked along from Kiel to Ranemede. And this was 1978 and all I could hear on Danda Street West is Maltese spoken, right? It it felt like I was back in a main street in Valletta or Slema and you know the big big cities in Malta. Completely, everybody speaking Maltese, uh, Maltese stores, the small little restaurants, and and so on and so forth. And then the hub being the church. Um, so so that was my initial experience. Um, then eventually I moved to. Halifax, and I started to terribly miss the Maltese <laughs> experience. Um, and, uh, but from 1995 until 99, I visited Toronto about eight or nine times because I, I applied and won a grant to do research about um, the Maltese immigrants in Canada. And I interviewed over 100 people most of whom are now deceased. And I have all these interviews on tapes, massive archival oral wow. history. Um, and um, I listened and listened and listened to hundreds of stories of Maltese immigrants who had spent their entire life in the junction. So lots of stories there. And of course, this is at the back of my unconscious and even conscious element when I was writing this novel. When I write about, you know, the family traits of FISA on Gilmore and St. John, it is, it is a pretty realistic, um, I did not have any particular person in mind, but the atmosphere, the ethos, the way of life, the contradictions, the tensions, the happiness, I think it is all there uh, echoed in these interviews, which I think had a huge, huge impact in my own personal personal life. I mean, these were, I interviewed people who were 94, 96 years wow. old, and who came to Canada when they were eight years old, and they vividly described for about 20 minutes the voyage from Malta until they reached Toronto. I mean, extremely, extremely emotive and compelling stories. This kind of, uh, again, not on my question list, but you're making me think here, this kind of trend, this theme of sort of transnationalism or transnational citizenship, 
is not really hasn't been one of your central research themes in your work at OISE, right? Am I well, wrong? Not, in not, not in my <laughs> not in my formal academic. Okay, but of course, um, I I I have always done work in the community, even in Halifax. Uh, and even in Montreal, but my community work, especially with the Maltese community in Toronto, um, increased when I came to Toronto. We used to have a Maltese newspaper, a bi-weekly Maltese newspaper, and I have my, I had my um, bi-weekly column, <laughs> and I used to write articles to engage the community, sometimes reflecting on, a, on an interview, reflecting on a historical fact about the Maltese in the junction, you know, like the relation of the initial Maltese in 1911-12 with the Irish and with the Jews in the junction, you know, I mean, right at the back of the Maltese church, there is an unused now um, Jewish, Jewish synagogue, for example. Very few people know this on Mariah Street, uh, and 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 these these kinds of things and other other activities with the Maltese community. I used to give talks and all all all, all sorts of of adult education, so to speak. And uh, I did all this oral history, um, not as part of my former research because I'm not a historian. My background is philosophy and literature. Uh, but but I, I consider it as a very important part of my own of my own my own work, and I have published I have published uh, both formal refereed articles on the history of the Maltese in Canada, and many popular articles in the local Maltese newspaper, which unfortunately is now defunct, and and also in in Maltese newspapers in Malta. Let me read a passage from the book because this is about a book. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to, it's from page 80, 81, I think, and it sure. goes like this. Sure. Sure. We Please were not Maltese Canadian or Turkish Canadian. We were Maltese Turkish Canadian. We embodied the ideal of Canadian multiculturalism mm -hmm. in theory only. For what is all this talk about diversity worth when so many people in this country still bear the brunt of disguised racism every day? Talk about that tension in Canadian multiculturalism. Yes, diversity is celebrated, but it also masks white supremacy and cultural hegemony. Yes, yes, uh, excellent. So now this is from the character Rona. And Rona in, in the novel is the mother of Faiza. And Rona emigrated to Canada in her early twenties. Um, after uh, she, she was a journalist, in in El Azig, which is uh, a pretty big town in the southern part of Turkey. I have gone to El Azig for <laughs> time, by the way, and worked pro bono uh, with an NGO at the University of El Azig, okay? I mean, all these places that are mentioned outside of Toronto, in Malta, in Turkey, in Morocco as well, in Spain. These are all places that I have visited myself, okay? So the descriptions are firsthand. They're very vivid, yeah. Okay, I mean, the bulk of it is in Toronto, but there is that transnational element also in the descriptions of multiple places in, in the novel. Um, so this is Rona, okay? She came to Canada at the age of 23, 24, um, exiled because of her political views as a journalist. Her brother was an activist and was killed. Her uncle was in Canada and she came to Canada, which is a classic immigrant sure. story, okay? And she meets and she is Muslim, but non-practicing Muslim. And she meets Joe, the father of Faiza, who is a traditional uh, Maltese laborer from the south end of Malta, okay? Uh, which has a certain connotation in Malta as well. It's, they are negatively stereotyped and so on. So this is, this is why I, I chose Joe like this. And yet Joe and Rona, very different politically, very different yeah. religiously. <laughs> they, 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 they agreed to get married and they had three kids, okay? So it is within that context that Rona is talking to us, the audience, commenting on her 
um, experience of multiculturalism in Canada. And this is why she says, we are not Turkish Canadian, we are not Maltese Canadian, we are Maltese, Turkish, Kurdistani Canadian, okay? And at the same time, while celebrating the diversity, she is critiquing, yes, the colonial element that and racist element that we still unfortunately encounter in Canada itself, okay? And some people say, but, but that's your voice. Yeah, it, I have, it happens to be my view, but, but it is the character of Rona. I mean, Rona is a mother who, who worked, ordinary work and brought up a family, uh, but you know, she is, she is an intellectual in her own way. She studied, she was a journalist, you know, so it's... Oh, but I, I, lo I love what you just said, because there, <clears throat> you can both celebrate the idea of diversity and critique it as a, as a colonizing logic as well. Of course. I mean, uh, and this to me is the way I look at, at, at reality from the existentialist experience. I mean, there is no reality without, um, without the dialogue. The, the dialogic experience, okay? Um, um, mm -hmm. I, as an individual, you as an individual, Jeff, and anyone else who is listening, we don't exist in and of it ourselves. We only exist in relation to others. And in relation to others, the others are of course human beings, animals, spirits, um, traditions, so-called objects, and so on and so forth, you know? I mean, but, but, I truly believe, not in a relative epistemology, because that is very dangerous. That can lead to anything goes. Yeah. Um, but to a relational epistemology. And a relation epistemology is completely different from either a narrow traditional so-called objectivist position, and also different from a completely relativistic skeptical epistemology. And, and I have written about this in my academic work. And in, in my case, this is the influence of the work of Paulo Freire. I mean, you know, Paulo mm, Freire's yeah, epistemology sure. is very much a relational epistemology. And this is my own personal view. I also see this kind of epistemology and way of perspective towards the world in many existential literary figures. I mean, for me, the classic existential literary figure that encapsulates this is, is Albert Camus, but also more recent ones, uh, Tahar Ben Jalun, a Moroccan who lived almost all of his sure. life since he was 17 in, in France, a very well-known um, literary figure in Europe, unfortunately almost unheard of in, in Canada. And, uh, and another Maghrebi Moroccan novelist who, who teaches literature in the West Coast in the United States, um, uh, Laila Lalami, okay? These are all exist current existentialist literary authors who write in a very critical, realist, um, minimalist manner. And they, they, have been, they have been a huge influence for me. They also all happen to be North African. The, the... Uh, it happened, they happen to be North African. Uh, and let us remember, North Africa is also part of the Mediterranean. And sure. Malta is right in the middle of the Mediterranean. And for thousands of years, we have been a bridge, not only between the North and, and South, the North being Southern Europe and the South being uh, the Maghreb and the Mashrek, Northern Africa but also between the West and the East, okay? We are in the center of the Middle Sea. <laughs> yeah, no, I, if I, the Middle Sea, I'm, I'm teasing here, if the Middle Sea is in the middle of the world, then of course Malta is in the middle of the world. <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of ifs here. I have so many more questions, but we'll probably have to cap it soon. I just, I'm going to ask maybe two more. One of them is, I couldn't help but, as I was reading, feeling how nicely the book would be adapted to a theatrical performance. And I wondered if you had that in mind at all as you were writing. Yes, in fact, I am working with a group in Malta uh, and with a scriptwriter, um, Maltese, who studied theater and works in London. 
I will not reveal the names at the moment because we are in the process of negotiating an agreement. And the aim is to have it turned into a play and produced um, uh, sometime early in 2023. Very nice. It could also be adopted into, into a film. Maybe yes. someone in Canada will 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 adopt it into into a film. You know, I mean, I think that's an open invitation to our audience to uh, contact John. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely, and yeah, so it's it's you know. The last question I'll ask you is: I just yesterday I think got an invitation from you on Facebook to a reading you're doing this weekend at the Oakville Literary Cafe. Uh, you have such a prolific writing career. I'm I'm curious what you're going to showcase at that event and why. A uh, uh, what? Sorry, again. The, you, you, you're doing a reading this weekend at the Oakville yes, Literary Cafe. This weekend, the Oakville Literary um, Association, and here I want. You may to have thank, forgotten until just now. <laughs> yes, yeah, I want to thank um, Josie De Shishio Andrews, who is an Italian Canadian author, um, uh, who has published mostly poetry, very nice poetry. Her latest book, which came out this summer, published by Guernica called Metastasis, an excellent collection of poetry. I fully, fully endorse it. I'm actually writing a review on, on, on this book. She runs this literary cafe and she invited me to talk about, about Faiza. But I think I will also talk about my, my I will showcase some of my, my, my poetry. John, I'm, this currently, been... I'm currently working on another collection of poetry. Um, I have a draft of it. And I am revising also a novel, which took me four years to write. I actually started writing this novel um, before I started writing Everyone But Faiza. Uh, and now I am in the process of revising it. Hopefully, it will reach publication by the summer of 2022. Can we get a preview? What's it about? Um, I, I will tell you the title. Okay, the title, I'll settle for the title. It, it may be a bit shocking. The title is called University Mafia. Ooh, that is very, a very provocative title. I will, I will stop there. It is okay. fiction. It is fiction, okay? But, but um, yeah. John, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. It's always a good sign when 50 minutes blows by and I look down at the clock and, and, and here we are. And so I want to thank you, Jeff, for the um, provocative, engaging questions. And of course, all the team, Courtney, um, Perry, Sim. Uh, I, I hope I haven't forgotten anyone else, but all of those people who worked behind the scene to organize this, um, to make sure that everything works well and so on. And I truly wish the Alumni Association all the very best in their endeavors. Thank you so much. Thank you to both of you. Oh my God, I could listen to this is engaging banter and thought provoking questions all evening. Uh, Jeff, you are a wizard of words and Professor Bertelli, huge thank you. Lots of uh, best wishes on your new title as well. We are very excited <laughs> and hopefully we can do season two of Writer's Roost with uh, that publication, but I'm very excited uh, about every, everyone but Faiza. Um, uh, Noreen Taj uh, in our audience, who is the former chair of the OIDI Graduate Research Conference, um, uh, all is also sharing that Faiza is a very common Muslim name in Pakistan as very, well. Very so, common, yes, yes. It yeah. is an Arabic name, it is a common name. Um, and and the names the names of the children of Joe and, and, uh, and Rona some are Christian, some are Muslim, uh, and there is also the name of Faiza's daughter. Okay, so I, I will stop there. I will not give. Sim, are we going to invite any people to ask questions if they wish? Um, you okay. are welcome to follow the your plan chat. Is. Yeah, so you're you're welcome to follow your chat. Um, the Q and A. Um, and Noreen actually really thanks you for the thoughts to both of you. She likes the idea of our existence in relation to others who could be people, nature, ideas, traditions, and everything around us. Yes. So thank you, Noreen, for those thoughts. Uh, thank, thank you, Noreen. You and there is Michelle. Yes. Hi, Michelle. Michelle is in <laughs> Nova Scotia. We used to teach together. And yeah, OK, many, many other memories with Michelle at, uh, at both uh, Acadia, Mount St. Vincent, and it, It's wonderful to see Dr. Ruth Cahill. 
Okay, also at Dalhousie. So, okay, yeah. all right. Uh, okay. Wonderful uh, OISE scholars are in the audience. Professor Ruth Heho, Julia Pan, um, uh, Dana Sheikh, uh, Sh Professor Shahzad Moshad. Uh, the, it's just such an honor to have thank amazing you. alumni. Thank you and very friends. much for all the people who attended. I mean, if you have questions, you can email me. You know my email from the OISE email. Um, I'll do a pitch for for the book for the sake of the of the publisher. The book is available for from Word and Deed. In Malta, it is available from Horizons. It is also available from Amazon. And in Toronto, it is available both from a different book list, which is on, um, on, on in, 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 in downtown, right? And the another story bookstore on Ronson's base. Yes, please uh, go ahead and purchase the book. Email Professor Portelli and uh, stay tuned with us. The recording of the event will be available. Someone is asking for my email. Okay, um, maybe I can write it in the chat. Perfect. Yes, and you have some former students in the audience as well, Dr. Portelli. Maybe you can write it, Jeff. I cannot write on the, ch on the chat. It's not allowing me to write on the chat. I don't think I can either, but if I... We'll and send it to everyone. We will yeah, send it. All right. Okay. That's perfect. Okay. okay. So then they can please. Oh, Fias is there. <laughs> ah, Fias. Oh gosh, this is Fias is from twenty years ago, I think. <laughs> okay, so the email address, Barb, is John dot Portelli. That's my first name dot last name at uToronto dot ca. The spelling, in case you don't have it. Everyone but Pfizer. Ah, no, no, I think I can type by saying, uh, ah, it allows you to type answer. Now I understand. Don't worry, John. We will make sure that everybody has the email address that signed up for the event. Yes, and someone is asking for the readings in my course. If you send me an email, I would gladly send you the course outline, which um, I plan to teach again although I'm retired, but I agreed to continue teaching this course on narratives of migration and exile implications for education this coming May. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Jeff. And Thank all you, the best Dr. for Dr. a good Dr. evening. Take care. Thanks, John. And Thank congratulations to all the graduates. Yes, and a huge congratulations. I'm going to get your book, Rebound, okay? Yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. I think, I think we need to talk, Perry. I didn't realize, uh, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Always a conversation. I love it. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much for your chat today. Thank you. Goodbye and good bye night, bye. everyone. Good night, bye. everybody. See you.